Now that we've defined what a function is and that we know what a domain, codomain, and range is, we're well equipped to study the three different types of functions we care about in discrete mathematics. And the applications of these special properties of functions will be very evident when we get to things like number theory um, and applications in cryptography. Okay? So the first type of function we care about is an injection or a one-to-one -one function. So we say some function f is injective or one-to-one -one if no two elements in the input have the same output. Okay? So another way of saying this is a function is injective if it satisfies a property that if two elements of the domain have the same output, then those two elements must be equal. Okay? So first, let's draw a picture. Okay? Suppose this represents our do domain and this represents our codomain. This function that I've drawn here is not an injection. Why? Well, it's because, let's say, because A and B both map to X. But for a function to be injective, every input needs to have a unique output. Okay? So, formally, we say a function is injective if f of x1 equaling f of x2, where x1 and x2 are in the input, implies that x1 is equal to x2, okay? And this symbol means implies. We'll talk more about it when we get to propositional logic. So again, to sort of illustrate what's going on here, here we have a diagram illustrating the domain and codomain, and we have the relationship between elements of the domain and codomain. And we have that both element A and element B map to the same output element X, but that is not an allowed in an injection because a function to be injective must satisfy that if the outputs are the same, the inputs are the same. And A is obviously not equal to B, okay? So a good exercise is determining whether or not these functions are injections, okay? And a nice, neat property um, that lets us determine whether or not a function is injective is it must pass the horizontal line test. Must pass horizontal line test, okay? So if you think back to when you learned about the vertical line test for functions, we saw that for some relationship or graph to be a function, it must pass the horizontal, the, the vertical line test, right? So for example, this is not a function because you know you draw your vertical lines and oh, it hits two different points, okay? So this is not a function. Well, so for a function to be in an injection, it has to pass both the, hor the vertical line test, so it has to be a function, but it also has to pass the horizontal line test. So an injection has to pass horizontal and vertical line tests, okay? And why does it need to pass the horizontal line test? Well, the horizontal lines tell us um, whether two out two input elements have the same output, right? Because the the y axis tells us what the outputs actually are. Okay, so that way we can check quickly to see if two elements have the same output, and then we'll know that it's not an injection. So what does the graph of e to the x look like? Well, it looks something like this. Do any two inputs have the same output? No, it doesn't look like it because it's strictly increasing. So f is indeed an injection. What about g, which uses that notation with the maps to symbol that maps elements x to their square root? Yeah, it does indeed look like an injection. It passes um, the vertical line test because it's a function, but also anywhere you draw a horizontal line, it's only going to hit one point. So g is also an injection. Okay, and we could also so that these are true algebraically by using this property here because we know that if two elements, for example with um, f, if e to the a is equal to e to the b, we know that for sure that a is equal to b. 
or that if the square root of a is equal to square root of b, we know for sure that a is equal to b. Okay? What about h of x is equal to x squared? Is this an injection? Again, let's draw the graph. We know it looks something like this. Is this an injection? Well, it passes the vertical line test, it's a function, but does it pass the horizontal line test? No, it doesn't, right? Because anywhere you draw a horizontal line, except for at the vertex, it hits two points, right? So x squared fails the horizontal test, line test, right? And so to put it in terms of this algebraic relationship we have defined here, if a squared is equal to b squared, does it imply that a is equal to b? No, because for example, two squared is equal to negative two squared, but two and negative two are of course not equal, right? So the function x squared satisfies the property that it maps elements a and negative a both to a squared, right? But a is not equal to negative a, right? Two is not equal to negative two, but both of them have the same output. So h of x is not an injection. It's still a function, but it's not an injection. Cool. So f and g are both injections, h is not. So now here's where we sort of started get in, getting into proof techniques, okay? And we'll formally cover proof techniques in the next chapter of the textbook. But here, it's a nice exercise to sort of justify to ourselves that the composition of two injective functions is also injective. Okay, so what does the composition of two functions look like? Well, if f is some function and g is some function, then the composition of f and g looks like f of g of x. Okay, so we want to prove that the composition of two injective functions is also injective. Okay, so what we're required to prove is that if f of g of x1 is equal to f of g of x2, then that must imply that x1 is equal to x2. And again, we haven't formally gone over exactly how this implication symbol works, but for now, let's only concern ourselves with the properties of what an injection function has. And we'll deal more with proof techniques in the following chapter. Feel free to go look at the following chapter and come back to here, if that might help. Okay, so let's see. So we know that f is an injective function, right? So f at whatever, in this case g of x1, being equal to g of x2 must mean that g of x1 is equal to g of x2 because f of box is injective, right? And we can sort of treat what, uh, whatever g of x1 is and whatever g of x2 has as being some box. It doesn't immediately matter to us right now that g is also a function, right? g of x1 is some number, g of x2 is some number. Because f is injective, it must mean that those two numbers are equal. Okay? Well, if it means that g of x1 is equal to g of x2, since g is injective, it means that x1 is also equal to x2, right? Because g at box is injective, right? Again, it doesn't matter what's inside, whatever is inside the parentheses for g. We know that if g at something is equal to g at something else, then those two things are equal, right? If we know that g of some square is equal to g of some triangle, where square and triangle is some variables, it means that square is equal to triangle. And that's sort of what we did in this first line with f, f composed that g, and that's also what we did here with just g on its own. So here we've proven that the composition of two injective functions is also injective. And again, if you're following along with this course at UC Berkeley, there's a problem on the homework that's very similar, but instead, uh, instead asks us to prove the composition of two surjective functions is also surjective. And so what's a surjection, you might ask? Well, that's what we're going to talk about now. So we say a function is a surjection, or it's onto, if every element in B 
is mapped to by some element in A. Alternatively, we can look at it as being a function whose codomain and range are equal. So all possible outputs are actually seen as being outputs. So the codomain and range are equal. Okay, so let's put this algebraically and also draw a picture. Okay, so to draw a picture, this function is not a surjection. It is an injection because every input has a unique output, but this fourth circle here has no input to this fourth circle. And again, the left column represents the domain, right column represents the codomain, but the range is only the three circles that actually have arrows pointing to it. Right. So this function is not a surge action because not everything in the codomain has an arrow pointing to it. So for a function to be onto or a surge action, the codomain, everything in the codomain has to have an arrow pointing to it. Okay? Everything in codomain has to have an arrow pointing to it. Cool. So to put this mathematically, and we're going to introduce some new notation here, what this says is that for all B in B, so what this symbol means is for all, there exists an A in A so for all B and B there is, exists an A in A such that and I know the colon and the vertical bar also mean such that but sometimes we also use S dot T dot F of A is equal to B so what this is saying is that for every element in the codomain there exists some element in the domain such that the function maps the function maps that element a in the domain to that element b in the codomain okay so for all elements in the codomain there exists some input a in the domain such that um, there's something mapping to that element in the codomain and that's exactly what we mean here okay so again what a uh, an onto function is or a surjection is is a function where the codomain and range are equal. All possible outputs are equal to all actual outputs. Okay? Um, and one way I remember the difference between on to and one to one is that in French, sur means on. Okay? I went to high school in Canada, so that's sort of how I um, remember it. And so a good question is what codomain and domain make f of x is equal to x squared a surge action. Okay, well, let's draw this graph. Okay, so by default, what is the domain? Is a set of all real numbers. Okay, what's the range? Well, it's all real numbers greater than or equal to zero, right? Another way of saying that is all non-negative real numbers. Okay, so the domain is not going to change. Now, our question is, what should we make the codomain? If we make the codomain equal to the range, then F will be a surjection, right? Because all possible outputs will be all real outputs. But if we make the codomain anything other than all non-negative real numbers, then the codomain will no longer be equal to the range. So an easy way to check if a function is a uh, surjection is by first determining what the range is, okay? And then seeing what the codomain is in respect to that. Cool, so now we know what a injection is and what a surjection is. A nice problem you can play with is how could you modify f of x is equal to x squared such that it is both an injection and a surjection, okay? And Speaking of functions that are both injections and surjections, we need to talk about what a bijection is, okay? So a function is a bijection when it's both an injection and surjection, okay? If and only if, another way we write that is IFF. We'll talk about this when we get to propositional logic.
again. But anyways, so a function is bijective if and only if it is both an injection and a surjection. Okay? So it's a bijection if and only if no two elements of the domain map to the same element in the codomain. This should say codomain. And every element in the codomain has something mapping to it from the domain. Okay? So the best way to explain this is again draw a picture. We can draw several examples here. Typically, this is what a bijection will look like, okay? For every element in the domain, there's exactly one output in the codomain, and there's nothing in the codomain that's not being mapped to, okay? So this right here is a bijection. We can draw an injection. But this is an injection, but not a surjection. Okay, because this fourth circle is not being mapped to. And this function here is a surjection, but not an injection. Because two, ta uh, two elements in the input are mapping to the same output. But um, it's a surjection because everything in the output has at least one arrow pointing to it. So we have three examples, what a bijection is, what an injection and not a surjection is, and what a surjection and not an injection is, okay? So the function is both surjective and injective, it is a bijection. So this diagram nicely summarizes the types of relations and functions we've seen thus far in this article. This first diagram represents something that's a relation, but not a function, right? And it's because this first element in the input has multiple output. And remember, a function satisfies the property that exactly one output for each input. Okay, so this first diagram is not a function. The second one is a function, but it's neither an injection or a surjection. Okay, it's not an injection because here we have two inputs corresponding to the same output, and we also have some element in the output that doesn't have a corresponding input. Right, so remember an injection, no two arrows to same output, and the surjection satisfies that each output has at least one arrow. Okay, so each output has at least one input. Okay, this third diagram is an injection because every input maps to a different output, but it's not a surjection because there's this last element here that doesn't have an input. This fourth diagram is not an injection, right, because we have two inputs more mapping to the same output, but there's no lone output that doesn't have an input, right? So every element in the output has an input, but um, not every input has unique outputs. This last diagram, perfectly summarizes what a bijection is, right? Because every input has a unique output and every output is mapped to by exactly one input, okay? So a function, a general function, has exactly one output for each input. But a bijection, right, has exactly one input for every output. So it's the opposite of the definition of a function. So a bijection has exactly one input for every output. So an interesting consequence of that is that if you take the inverse of a bijective, bijective function, the inverse is also a function, right? And so you should convince yourself or ask questions on Piazza to show that it's true that not all injective functions have inverses and not all surjective functions have inverses. For a function to be invertible perfectly, it must be bijective, right? So function has inverse means the function is bijective. And if you're again following along with the class at UC Berkeley, you will do a lot of practice homework problems in determining whether or not some functions are bijections, injections only, surjectives only, or not even functions. Cool.